25 years ago, I called this man on the phone and I asked for his daughter's hand in marriage. The way he responded was very, very odd because he started shouting hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Jesus. You sent me someone perfect to marry my daughter. No, and all kidding aside, I've grown to know this couple very well and uh, Dr. Morocco has become my second dad. He's an amazing man of God. I cannot even, I, I could talk forever about him. But I'm telling you right now, it's not just that, but you're about to hear from the greatest teacher, in my opinion, on this planet. You are going to find out why. Guys, I want you to just introduce you to your senior pastor, Dr. James Morocco. Woo! Pastor John, you survived the interview on the phone. <laughs> Anita... What a joy to see you tonight and your lovely daughter. That's Pastor John's mama and sister. Would you give them a big hand? And Dad is out in the car. Hey! And I want to introduce somebody that means an awful lot to me. And that is the person who God used to help us finance this property. And uh, he's been a He's been a great man of encouragement to me and to our ministry. We have a lot of different banks we work through, but there we go. Uh, this is a bank you can be a part of. It's a credit union called the Assemblies of God Credit Union. And all of you ought to be members of it. And they give great loans and great rates. And they finance this property purchase for us. Brother Jeff Bertzel, would you stand? The Vice President of ABCD. Because their money goes to help churches get built and properties get purchased. Thank you, Jeff, for coming. And every time I call, he's been so gracious to be there, to be a part of whatever we need to have done. And we're buying properties everywhere. And I'm telling you why. I think you should help us with uh, another property or another property here. Or Will, I can't recall. We've bought so many properties lately that. I can't keep track of all the different ones we're buying. But I want to share a word with you. If you have your Bibles, if you have not stand with me. I want you to read the word of the Lord with me just for a moment. I prayed and asked God, Lord, what would you like me to share with your people? And I felt like the Lord said, share this. So I'm going to do it. It's found in Mark chapter 5, verses 24 through 34. Let me read it with you. I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, when she what? Everybody say, when she heard. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power, everybody say that's power. power. Power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. He said, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be free from your suffering. Come on, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. It is a lamp and a light. It is that which nourishes our spirit. It's that which gives us direction. And I thank you for hungry people who on a Sunday night would come to celebrate what you're doing. So I pray, Holy Ghost, come. Come on, people, let's pray in the Holy Ghost. Spirit of the living God, come in power, come in mind. Anoint me to preach your word, that which you laid on my heart. I pray you give us ears to hear and a heart to respond and eyes to see. I pray when we leave tonight, we'll leave full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost. And our lives will never be the same again. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There are three questions. That if you answer them correctly, will change everything in your life. 
There are three questions that reflect the nature of your faith. In fact, how you answer these three questions will set the course of your life. What will happen in your marriage? What will happen in your family? What will happen in your business? What will happen on your job? What will happen in this church? What will happen in your future? These three questions are seen by the way a woman with a great need came to Jesus. So let's take a look at the text. The three Gospels mention this story, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels. But what's interesting is when you get to the Gospel of Mark, it has great detail. And I think the reason for that is because Mark is a disciple of Peter. In fact, he really shares many of the stories Peter would share when Peter preached. And somehow this incident that happened in the life of Jesus affected Peter greatly. Take a look at this woman's condition. She had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. She had suffered greatly in her quest for a remedy. She was financially bankrupt. She spent all she had on the doctor. She was desperate. And she heard about Jesus. She hadn't seen him before. She simply heard about him. That he was coming, and although unclean, she gets into the crowd. Her plan was to come up behind him and touch the hem of his garment. And she believed the moment she did that, she'd be healed. The moment she touched Jesus, says power went out for him and she was healed. Now, Jesus says something very strange, at least in the minds of the disciples. He said, who touched my clothes? Now, what's interesting here is the disciples respond, wait a minute, hello, we're in a crowd, everybody's touching you. In fact, when you read the Gospels, you'll notice that people had this belief that they, if they could just touch his clothes, they would be healed. Because his power was was flowing even through his clothes. The disciples didn't realize the difference between physical touch and the touch of faith. This woman touched Jesus dramatically. She touched him with faith. Well, Jesus stopped everything he was doing. And you say, now wait a minute, Pastor. Why would Jesus take time to stop and and, and, and point out this woman, try to get her attention. She said, it touched me. And, and everything stopped. I thought about it often. I believe it was because he wanted this woman to testify what he had done so he could teach his disciples about faith. This is a dramatic story about the faith of one woman. But secondly, I believe she, he wanted to affirm her faith. You did good. How many ever want to hear that said about you? You did good. And thirdly, he wanted to confirm her healing. That the suffering she experienced was not coming back. He said, well, Pastor, what is God speaking to us? Well, he's speaking to us three questions. And here's the first question. What do you see? What do you see? You see, she could have seen just another rabbi. She could have seen just another disappointment. But her faith was built up by what she heard, and so she saw Jesus as her healer. I want you to think about this a moment, because what you see makes all the difference in the world. How do you see Jesus? Who do you see Him to be? Is He just your Savior? Is He your baptizer in the Holy Ghost? Is He your healer? Is He your provider? Is He your shepherd? Is He your banner? And does He fight your battles with you? Is He the picture of all that is seen of God in the Old Testament? I say yes. He's true. He's grace. He's everything we would ever need, but so oftentimes we don't see him as that. We 
see him as a religious figure that when 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 I maybe desperately desperately need him, I'll I'll call the pastor. Listen, he wants to be everything to you. How do you see this church? Uh, it's another little church in, in Ozark. I don't really know if it's ever going to go anywhere. <laughs> see, how do you see? You see this is the beginning of a miracle where thousands of people will be touched. Yes. You see it as just a place where you fulfill your religious obligation or do you see it as a place where the visions and dreams God's given you could be fulfilled. Yeah. You see it as a place filled with the power of God. What do you see? You see, what you see is what you get. I learned this a long time ago when I first went to college. You see, what I saw came to when I went to Maui was a little church, 80 adults and 20 kids, 100 people. But before I went there, God gave me a vision of a massive church of thousands of people. It's a little island of 60,000. There isn't any more on there. You'd have to swim to get there <laughs> or fly in. But I saw something. Never forget the first Sunday. I met the men of the church on the Saturday, the day before, and I had such a strong faith that God was going to double the church the first Sunday that I told them to meet me with sledgehammers and we tore down power to the church. We knocked down the wall that separated the Sunday school room from the sanctuary. The church only held 150 people and I believe we'd have 200 there that Sunday, the first Sunday of May, 1980. We knocked out the lobby. I rented chairs, I stuck them in there, and oh, I tell you what, Saturday night, I was praying, and boy, every demon in hell was laughing at me. Ah, look at you! Nobody's going to show up! That morning, people came from everywhere. We had over 200 people in church. That little church of 100 people in a year and a half had gone to the back became one of the fastest growing churches in America. became one of the largest churches in the state. And within two and a half years, in fact, it was within a year, it was in January of 1982, it was in May of 1980, God gave us the largest auditorium on the island, the big state. You know how that happened? It was a, interesting thing happened. It was a skating rink, and it said, Now we skate palace. But God had put it in my heart that was going to be our new church home. And every time I drove by it, I didn't see Maui skate palace. I saw the name of our church. I remember one day, I was so excited. I drove by it. My wife was driving. I said, Honey, what do you see? I said, Maui skate palace. <laughs> I said, No! <laughs> At midnight on January 1st, 1982, we walked about five blocks from our little chapel to that skating rink. That was our first step. God gave us what we saw. And then God said, this is going to be too small, even though it was the largest auditorium on the island. I'd drive by a piece of property, and I'd reach my hand up to it, and I said, Lord, if you ever let me build a building, I want to build it right there. I saw it. I saw it. The day when you go to Maui, in the most, most prestigious corner of the entire island, you have to drive by it to go anywhere on Maui, is the largest church building in the state, worth over 50 million dollars and it's paid for. Somebody say hallelujah. God is waiting for you to see what he wants you to see. 
Pastor John saw something. You're sitting on it right now. Yeah. What do you see? What do you see? Never forget an incident that happened to me. I was a young preacher. In fact, it was, I was trying to figure it out. It was close to 47 years ago. We were in our early 20s, my wife and I. We were two years out of college. We bought our first home. We were the youth pastors of a Assembly of God Church in Wilmington, California. There was a neighbor who lived behind us. He was a good old boy. Didn't know God. But a nice guy. I don't know much about rednecks, but whoever is a redneck, he would have been a redneck. Amen. <laughs> Wonderful man, but didn't know the Lord. And had no interest. One day I was praying. His name was Sam. I was praying for Sam. I said, God, would you save Sam? And I was interrupted in my prayer by the word of the Lord. He said, do you believe I'm Sam? I said, no. <laughs> Listen, guys, I didn't have the thing. He was, he was, well, he was. <laughs> he wasn't anywhere in the ball. I'll never forget what God said. I want you to see Sam saved. I want, when you pray for him, I want you to see him saved. So I changed my prayer. Began to thank the Lord for him being saved. I began to see him saved. Well, we left Wilmington. We moved to Hawaii. Must have been about a year or two later, my wife and I happened to be in the area, and we spoke at our church that we passed it in. The Sunday night service, and guess who was in church that Sunday night? It was Sam. I was shocked to see him. And after the service, he came to me and said, Would you mind stopping by my house? Of course, I knew exactly where he lived. He lived behind us for those four years. And I, uh, I stopped by. And I'll never forget what that said. We walked in, my wife and I. Him and his wife were standing in the living room. And he said, I've been wanting to do this for some time, but I want to do it with you. Would you pray with me for receiving Jesus? You could have knocked me over with a feather. And I'll never forget we joined hands together. And Sam and his wife gave their lives in church. Listen, hear me, hear me! What you see makes a difference. But there's a second question. It's not just what you see. Second question is, what do you say? What do you say? This woman said to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Did you know self-speak is a powerful thing? David in Psalm 42, 5 says, Why art thou cast down on my soul, and why art thou dispirited in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his count. We need to speak to ourselves. Hey, self! What are you doing here? Why are you so depressed? Oh, Master, you're weird. No, I'm biblical. <laughs> what do you say? What do you say about yourself? Oh, I'll never amount to much. Stop it. I can't do this. I say that often, except and I always get reminded by the Lord, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Well, I'll never make a difference. That's not God talking. Oh, I blew it! If you're still breathing, there's hope. Amen. What are you going to say about this church? Somebody asked. Why you can't? There won't be enough room for you if you don't get
get in right now? God's going to do great things. seminar where a Christian businessman had said that he had given a hundred thousand dollars to his church. He'd made a million dollars and he tithed on it and he gave a hundred thousand. This man was named Kevin. This electrician in my church, young man. He came to me one day and he said, Pastor, I'm going to give a hundred thousand dollars this year. I'm believing God's going to bless my business and I'll make a million dollars and I'm going to give a hundred thousand. Now, you know as well as I know if you've pastored for very long, you have a lot of people saying a lot of wild things. You wonder if they'll ever come about. But did you know that year, Kevin gave a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. He was the first person in our church to ever give over a hundred thousand. Are you here? He spoke it He spoke it I seek the Lord for a word from Him every year. It's the word of the Lord for our church. This year it's empowered to serve. And I preached a series of messages on it. Maybe your pastor will be sharing that as well. But one of the things that God has led me to do is to give a vision to the house for either a three-year period or a five-year period. And in 2010, he gave us a vision. It was called the 12020. That is, we believed that we would have 120 extensions and minister to 20,000 every week. In 2015, at our Celebrate Conference, where we celebrate what God has done for that year, we reached that goal, and one of the most moving moments in my life was to see 120 banners march down the aisle of the cathedral, each one representing a congregation, and we rejoiced together. And then God gave us another vision for the next five years. It's called the 123, 100 churches in the mainland in the United States, 200 overseas, 30,000 disciples in our life. Well, COVID showed up, but God still worked. We broke the 300 mark of extensions at Cave Kings. Come on, somebody say yeah, hallelujah. hallelujah. We didn't get to celebrate like we normally did, so we're celebrating next year. So show up on Maui and we'll have a time. But at our meeting this year, God gave me another vision for one year. It's called Vision 500. But between now and May of next year, we'll be one church with 500 congregations. Do I have any faith under this tent tonight? You're a part of it. That's why you're here. Because God's going to spread through you extensions all over this area. I dedicated our new building in Branson. It's the finest building in all of Branson. We bought the Music City Center, and oh man, is it gorgeous. I tell co-pastor Chris, no fair. No fair. He's got a prettier building than I have. But it's all of us. If you're ever vacationing down there, 
and you can convince Pastor John you can stay over Sunday, you'll want to go. Otherwise, you better listen to your pastor and come home. Amen. We just bought a mall on the Big Island. Closed on Thursday. It's downtown Kong. It's called the King Kamehameha Mall. We're opening up a massive church. God's going to give me the bigger. Years ago when he spoke to me to start extensions, he said, I want you to go to Molokai. Molokai is a little island of 6,000 people. This was within two years after we had established the church on Maui. And he says, just as the mayor is the mayor of three islands, I want you to pastor three islands, Maui, Molokai, and Lanai. Molokai is a demonized island, or it was. It's not anymore. I wept when I first went there. When God said, I want you to start an extension, I said, okay, I'll find a pastor on my staff who's willing to go. And there was a guy, you know, they're, they're in every church. Oh, pastor. I want to be a pastor. I said, wonderful. I know where I'm sending him. <laughs> Put him on an airplane, sent him over to Molokai for a life group. We had in a house. Came back the next day and said, I ain't going. I just ain't going. <laughs> I couldn't find anybody on my staff to go. Finally, one day in prayer, God said, I didn't tell you to send somebody. I told you. I'm pastoring one of the largest churches in the state, two services on Sunday morning in a skating rink. I catch a little airplane and fly to Molokai to minister to a handful of people. But out of that has come a church now in Molokai that has four congregations. Somebody say hallelujah. God is giving me the island of Molokai. What do you see? What do you say? Final thing is, what do you show? See, say, show. What do you show? What actions do you show? You can have all kinds of dreams, and you can speak all kinds of nonsense. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Where are you going to stretch? I went to Maui, our little church was worth $150,000. That's all it was. A little tiny building. Made of handmade bricks by the church congregation. Today our church is worth over $120 million. Came about by radical faith. I'll never, I'll never forget when I signed the document to buy the skating room freaked me out. Our little church was poor. When I came to be its pastor, the entire income of the whole church for a whole year was $50,000. Out of that, you had to pay the pastor, all the missionaries, all the upkeep of the church. They couldn't even pay me the salary I was getting in the church I came from. I said, God, I said, God, how's this going to work? How's this going to work? He said, son, you teach on giving. Don't ever be intimidated to receive an offering. And thirdly, he said, you model. Not always tithe, and I always give to missions, and I always give bless gifts to people. But I didn't know anything about giving, really giving. I learned that there's a God who honors sacrificial giving, honors the sacrifice that you make, honors it. That little skating rink was going to cost us $20,000 a month. We were only bringing in $30,000 every month, and we were already spending it. That meant $20,000 more than we had every month. And I'll never forget sitting at the bank with my pen in hand, putting my name on the document that I'd pay the note knowing we had no money to do it. A lot of people talk. You lay your life down. 
if you're going to do something significant for God. That's the way it is. Now, years later, 20,000 seems absolutely nothing when you need millions and millions and millions and millions every year. Our budget is no longer 50,000 a year, it's over 15 million. Rapidly growing. This has been our greatest year in giving. We're praying for two million dollars every month. You say, what are you gonna do with all that money? It's already spent. <laughs> We're gonna open up more extensions. You're gonna open them up right here in Missouri. Come on, smile at me. Some of you aren't smiling. Some of you have had dreams and visions to do great things for God. You're in the right place. <laughs> What do you see? What do you say? What do you show? A number of years ago, God spoke to me and said, I want you to open a church in Honolulu. Honolulu is a big city. Has a million, about a million people. Now it's a tiny place, a big island in terms of land mass, but not big population. We're about one tenth the size of Honolulu. That I want you to open a church in Honolulu. I said, I said, God, look, I said, God, there's plenty of churches in Honolulu. They don't need me. He said, I'm going to bring a mighty revival. I want you to be a part of it. So I had I had to speak at a major conference there. And so while I was there, I, I figured, well, I better try to obey the Lord. So my wife and I drove into the area that God had called us to which was East Oahu, which is the most expensive real estate in all of Hawaii. We went and visited an Episcopalian church hoping that they would want to rent it to us on a Friday night miracle service, but they didn't want any loud mouth Pentecostal in their church. <laughs> and I was driving out, I, I noticed it when I came to I was driving out and there was a shopping center. There was a Kentucky Fried Chicken in the parking lot. I like the cookie right <laughs> And there was a tiny supermarket, and for whatever reason, I felt ready to stop. I said, honey, let's stop here. I stopped, got out of the car, walked into that tiny supermarket. Fully functioning store. I walked through, I said, I saw it. I said, wow, this would make a great church. I stood outside, never forget on the sidewalk right outside of that time suit. Like I said, God, if you want me in the water, I want this building. Got in my car and I left. God's done that many times for me in places all over the world. About three months later, I happened to be talking to one of the realtors in my church in Maui, and I said, look, would you uh, look for property on Oahu? I'd like to buy a, buy a building, I, uh, we're, we're going to start a church there. I didn't tell him what I saw, I didn't say a thing. Not a month later, we were in a men's prayer breakfast, and I said, Alan, I said, what did you find? He said, well, there's a, there's a supermarket going out of business. That's all he said, he didn't tell me why. I said, is it the time supermarket with the Kentucky Fried Chicken in the parking lot? <laughs> His eyes got big, and he said, oh! Yeah. How did you know? I said, that's my building. Yeah. Well, I negotiated to lease it. And God, in the middle of the negotiation, said, you will outgrow it. You better buy, buy the whole shopping center. Did I have a dime? I didn't have a dime. Not a dime. But I negotiated the deal. And I put a three-year option to buy. They stick with a three-year option to buy. Two years passed. And we were struggling just remodeling that time supermarket. I thought it was going to cost a million. It cost five million. I was dying. I said, oh, God. And God says to me, buy it! Buy the whole shopping center! I said, you've got to be kidding. How am I going to do it? Told me to call somebody that I've met a year before. I call him on the phone. I said, Look, well, we'd like to buy the shop and send you a He said, I will. 
They financed the entire thing. We bought that shopping center. I saw it, I spoke it, and then I took action. Yeah. Listen to me, that's everything I know. That's what faith is. My wife has become a woman of faith. One day she came to me and she said, she said, honey, she said, I believe God's speaking to me to start a ministry of drug addicts and, and alcoholics. I said, what? I said, how are you going to do that? You don't know anything about it. We've never had drugs or alcohol, you know. We're both raised in Christian homes. I said, how are you going to do that? She said, I don't know. She began to pray and God spoke to her and said, there are people in your church that I've delivered. They've been in prison. I've delivered them. They're going to help you. So she's sitting on the front row. She saw it. She spoke it. She's sitting on the front row of our church. And a young man came to put the daily seat in, which is our building fund. We're going to do that tonight, I'm sure about it. And she felt prompted to ask him if he would help her. Name was Dan. So as he was leaving the daily seat box, she said, Daniel, she said, I want to start this ministry with your help. She knew nothing about it other than she'd seen him in church. And he wasn't real faithful. There was a prompting of the Holy Ghost. He said, I'll help you. What she didn't know is he was an alcoholic. He'd been a drug addict and now an alcoholic. He'd been in prison. We wouldn't see him for weeks on end. It's because he was on a drug. And he said, I'll help you. And that first night she opened on a Monday night, he was there. Today, Daniel is a pastor in my church, pastoring one of our extensions. Somebody say hallelujah. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people are being touched by that. What do you see? What do you say? What are you sure? Stand here for you. Lift both hands in the air. Let's begin to praise Him. God's going to give this house a gift of faith. Things are going to happen rapidly. You're going to be a part of it. This is your time. Lift your voice. Come on. Lord, I'm asking you now to move in power. There are men and women here who have a heart for you. They yearn for you more than anything else. They cry out to you. And Lord, I'm asking that you'll drop a seed of faith in them. They'll accomplish it. They won't look back at what's happened in the past. They'll say, God, you put in my heart a desire and it will come forth. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing right now. I pray, oh God, touch, touch, touch people praying in the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God's Christ. Holy Ghost come. Holy Ghost come. Touch. You give us the gift of faith, Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Ghost come. Holy Ghost. Jesus. 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 Pastor Colleen, let's lay hands on that. Pastor John, Pastor Jamie. Lord, we pray for the gift of faith and the gift of leadership. Lord, I pray this congregation every day will pray for the gift of faith and leadership on this couple. Lord, you'd raised him up and fulfill. You gave him the dream of his heart, his property. But now, Lord, bring forth the rest of A vibrant congregation that will touch this whole area. Do it. Let the word of the Lord come forth in power. I pray. Hallelujah. I want every head bowed, everyone pointing. You might be here and you've never given your heart to the Lord. Please, I don't want you going to hell for Mozart. Not at the extreme cost of what Jesus did. If you're not saved, please let tonight be the night. You say, I'm backslidden. I used to serve the Lord, but I'm not where I should be. Then let's get right tonight. You say, Pastor, would you pray for me? No one looking around just between you and God. You'd say, Pastor, pray for me. If that's you, slip your hand up right now. Quickly, quickly, I'm going to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Yes, God bless you. God bless you. I want everyone to lift your hands as a sign of surrender to God. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, Jesus. I ask you tonight to forgive me of my sins. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me brand new. 
You died for me on the cross. You died for me on the cross. So I could be forgiven. You took my punishment. And you rose from the dead. And you rose from the dead. So I could have eternal life. So I could have eternal life. Jesus, come into my life now. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. My Savior. My King. And I will serve you with my whole heart. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Just ask Jesus to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, come. Come on, people, just pray in the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, come. Come upon this country. Oh, Holy Ghost. Come, Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. We're going to close in just a moment. I'm not see everyone to look at this. I believe all of us are tired of you know that. Tithing is not giving. Tithing is just honoring God with what He's giving. Everything we have is given. Giving is based upon the tithe, which is all the offering. When we were building the cathedral on Maui, we had no money. I said, God, how are we going to do this? The Lord quickened to me something. He said, I want your people to plant a seed. It's not their tithe, it's not their normal giving, it's a seed. And I will bless them. So we began what we call the daily seed. It's an offering just before the tithe. We've done it since 1985. And over those years, not only has the cathedral been paid off, but we've built churches all over the world. We've been given a great challenge. Not just the paying off of this land. You're not doing it alone. Now we have to work to build the building there. And we'll help you. But I'm not here to just build the building. I'm here to build people. I'm here to see God work on your behalf. And I know what I'm talking about. When we were building the cathedral, God spoke to me. He said, Sell your house and give it all. Thank you. God blessed me with a better house. 1996, God spoke to me since then. And you believe that you can give a thousand dollars a week? I reminded him I'm a pastor. I don't have business. I'm a pastor. I'm on a fixed salary. I don't think that's possible in the natural, Lord, but I'll obey you. He gave me one idea in the option market. I made a significant amount of money, and that year I gave $64,000. From that year on, for the next four years, I gave over $52,000. Every year, 2000 God said, I'll double it. Give over $100,000 every year for those two years. Gave over $80,000 each of those years in 2001 and 2002. But after two years, every year we're giving over $100,000. I have to go in and get money to come to my house to do way beyond what my salary is. They pay my house and car, they give me a salary. It's way beyond that. Are you hearing me? But here's what I found out about God. You can never not give me. You can never give me. God gave me one investment. My wife and I have given almost $3 million into this house. We're not playing the games here. If God's word is true, then it's going to be true for me. And when he said, the generous man will prosper, I believe it. When Jesus said, given it shall be given, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. I believe it! Yes. So I give like I believe. You know, in one investment, God gave me back everything I've ever given in my life. Are you listening? You will be givers. You will be scared. God will tell you what you will be The power of God. Until you move into the dynamic of the 
want you to ask. I want you when you stand before the Lord. Lord, you've done everything you can do. So I'm going to ask you to receive it right now. See, our day of seed is the first time we've ever done it here in Ozone. But every Sunday, Pastor John, in every service, you're going to receive the daily seed before the tithe and offering. And your people are going to respond. I tell you what we're going to do. Now, my wife and I are going to give a, a seed tonight. We uh, we give about we, we one one year God spoke to us and said give a hundred dollars every time the daily seed bomb shows up. Well, it shows up four times a week. Hallelujah. So I want you to write a check of four hundred dollars. And whatever it is, go ahead. You want to do more? You want to give a thousand? Yeah. Well, let's okay, we will do that. We're going to give a thousand. No, no. And I will never ask you to do something I don't do myself. Are you hearing? Are you hearing? Brad, come back and slap you. Are you hearing me? Yes, You give what God says to you. But every Sunday, you have, please. This goes to this building, this property. How many believe we can pay this property off in a year? How many believe that? Yeah. Hallelujah! Somebody have some faith. How many believe we can pay it off in a year? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Pastor John, got a few hallelujahs. All right. And here's what we're going to do. This is the way we do it on Maui, so we might as well do it here. Just watch your step. I'm kind of leaning this way. But, um, hey, where's the bucket? Come up to the front on this side here. On this code.
visit you've given us. And Lord, the visions of your people here in this place. Lord, I thank you and praise you. Now we're going to dedicate this property to the Lord. Just remain standing. I'm going to have you just a moment to reach your hands out to the north, south, east, and west. And uh, where are you going to go, Pastor John? How do you want to do Well, do whatever you want. <laughs> I tell you what, you stay there, just don't fall over. I won't. I got If you're here, we'll put Pastor Jamie on that corner. I'll go back to that corner. And Pastor will leave one of you come right over here. Alright, now. And we'll, we'll just, we'll just say it represents all four corners. Alright, okay. Now listen, the Bible tells us we sanctify ourselves with prayer and the word. What we preach, the word, we pray. Now this is just plain horrible. Something special. It's no sacred thing inside this room, but it's a secret from the Holy Spirit. In a moment, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pour this oil into this room. I'm going to break off any demonic power that may linger in this place from the past year and a half. I'm going to believe that just as God is supernaturally divided in Christ, He will supernaturally build this world. And we'll all stand in awe of Given us I'm going to ask you just to reach your hand out anywhere you want. And I want you to pray like this is property you personally own. It's even greater than that. It's property of the Lord. Lord. Let's pray. Come on, everyone. Let's pray. Father, as I pour oil on this land, the symbol of your spirit, I break off every power of evil that would attempt me. To hinder this work, I declare in the mighty name of Jesus, you pal, leave a thing, take your hands off this property. This has been dedicated now to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so we say, Lord, let the blood you spilt on Calvary and the efficacy of that blood cover this place. And the oil, a picture of you, O Holy Ghost, may you hover over this place. May what is built here bring glory to the mighty name of the Lord. I pray, oh God, whatever buildings are built, whatever's done here, you would be pleased. And I pray, oh God, you would raise up a mighty church. And from this church, may the world be touched. May missionaries go forth. May pastors go forth. May people leading in the marketplace go forth. Lord, I thank you. We dedicate now this property to you. For your glory, honor, and praise. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Give Jesus a big hand.